Silicon Valley has been the cradle of this sort of series of innovations that over the last decades have propelled uh, technology and world economy. But all of the resources, all of the intelligence has been invested into the immaterial, the digital realm, the internet. It was just fascinating to be seeing the physical reality of a valley that has changed the world. And that valley actually itself hasn't changed. Tech really hasn't adopted a particular language for buildings. I mean, we've just found old buildings, and we've moved into them, and, uh, and we've made do the best we could. We have an opportunity to build new buildings, which is nothing unique, uh, which people do every day all over the world. But what we've tried to do is take a step back and say, how do buildings work with nature? You know, what will transit look like in the future? Not what is transit today. We're really making sure that we make spaces very open and accessible, so it's just not for Googlers, but it's for anyone who lives in the area to come by. Um, and then the last piece, which is really Google at its heart, in anything we do, trying to leave the project, giving something back to the world um, that they didn't have before we started. We scour the world looking for a special architect we could really do something different. We really listened and created stuff from the ground up. And um, we really got down to what we believed were the two best in class. <laughs> My name is Bjarke Ingels. Uh, I'm an architect and the founder of uh, Bjarke Ingels Group, or simply BIG. The BIG studios, they're ambitious. They do a lot of very community-focused projects, and that was pretty compelling to us. Good, that was a good reaction, by the way. My name is Thomas Heatherwick. I'm the founder of Heatherwick Studio. Thomas, on the other hand, has this attention to human scale and beauty that I haven't seen uh, in anyone before. And you bring those two people together, somebody who really thinks about function and form, and you couple that with beauty, and you just have this team that um, does pretty amazing stuff. When we uh, met each other in Mountain View, we thought that it would be uh, interesting to work with each other and Google to maybe come up with something that would be much more creative than anything we could have come up with ourselves. What is the best possible environment we can make to invent, engineer, and most importantly, make ideas happen and go out into the world? It's cool. It's cool. When you visit the Google campus, there's lots of trees. But there's this constant major undermining of that by the, uh, the road system and the infrastructure required for all of those cars. And it just feels like trees are like street furniture. Uh, and everything has turned into parking lots. We're trying to sort of reverse this, this process and really sort of recreate some of the natural uh, qualities that have been there in the first place. Really transform the sea of parking that you find today into a, sort of a, a natural landscape where you'll find an abundance of green both outside but also inside. These are greenhouses that enclose and protect pieces of nature. Next to ecologically sensitive areas, we're able to pull back buildings and create wildlife habitat. We're able to um, create areas where we're restoring waterways that bring water out to the bay. It's interesting to try and look at how you can really uh, augment or turn the dial up more on, on that nature, at the same time as looking to really protect the, the land use. Google's presence in Mountain View is, is simply so strong 
that it can't be the fortress that shuts away nature, that shuts away the, the neighbors. It really needs to become a neighborhood in Mountain View. A motivator for the work we're doing now is to be generous. You can provide facilities that can be shared with people who don't work for an organization and keep an organization's feet on the ground. The buildings themselves allow both the public as well as employees to move through them. We wanted to make sure that we created communities where bikes and pedestrians felt like they didn't have to worry about cars zipping by at 70 miles an hour. Part of our work is to try to find ways to make places that you would go and have a conversation and go for a walk with great pleasure and choose in a weekend to, to be. So in that sense, our idea for the Google campus is really to give it the diversity, uh, the liveliness that you find in an urban neighborhood, so that a lot of the traditional distinctions in an urban setting or in an office environment uh, will have evaporated or at least been blurred significantly. How will we work five years from now? How will we work 15 or 20 years from now? We don't know what it's going to be, but we know that it just needs to be this incredibly flexible space for it to work. In nature, things aren't over-programmed or over-prescribed. And in a way, if our cities or our work environments could have more of this flexibility or openness for interpretation, they would become more stimulating and more creative environments to live and, and work in. In a traditional building, reconfiguring from office space to automotive to biotech would take months and years, and you would knock those buildings down, and then five or ten years later, you'd do it again. The desire, really, is to try to create pieces of environment you can work in, in multiple ways. Suddenly, within this, the architecture of the building becomes almost like uh, giant pieces of furniture that can be connected in different ways. It's almost like the Lincoln Logs when we were kids. You can just pile them up and assemble them differently with basically no new materials. It's a sort of structure of looking, in a way, at the historic city model of making streets. And then this is not the historic model of making environments that bring together and protect those streets. Instead of having buildings as these like uh, boxes with walls and floors, dissolve the building into a simple, super transparent, ultra light membrane. Creating, in effect, a piece of glass fabric and draping it across some tent poles. And we're blurring the outside world and the inside world. We're really thinking about how do we create buildings that draw less energy? How do we create buildings that use less water than a traditional building? And all of this science and know-how is going into this project. We will keep developing, we'll keep researching in terms of materials or technologies. The architecture will evolve as, uh, as times evolve. There are, there are ways that we can try and make space that isn't just for the next five or ten years, but for many decades to come. Between like these three different uh, minds or three different companies working together, uh, I think we have really arrived at something that I'm dead certain we wouldn't have arrived at if any one of us were like uh, working in, uh, in isolation. We have a duty to reflect in the physical environment the values that have been manifested in the innovations that have come out from this part of California. A humanistic spirit is something that it feels really important to embody in what we build. And so that's shared between all of us and is exciting and driving us and will be, in its way, uh, revolutionary.